doing it. Of course, this is where we've all spent a lot of time um, preparing to go out into the wilds of Antarctica and then coming back and ripping our clothes off so we can go to the restroom and uh, warm up our feet from being numb. Um, one unique thing about this room is that it has a hole in the middle of it that goes all the way down to the ocean. That's underneath this right here. It's called the moon pool officially. It's two and a half meters wide in diameter and goes down um, three decks to the ocean and that's the rushing that we hear is the, basically just the ocean underneath it. There's also vents that lead from that chamber up into the uh, fifth and sixth deck so sometimes when you're walking around up there you hear this whooshing sound out of a few of those vents and that's just to release the pressure in and out from, from the pitching of the ship. Um, so this is the first room that was built in this ship. Um, we used to have uh, a radio operator on this vessel who was part of the original design team for these ships. And so he, he was explaining some of this to us as well. But he said this was the first room that they designed, the geographical center of the ship. So this is the point around which, using the bow and stern thrusters that we'll see a little bit later, the ship can rotate on a dime right from here. And part of what it, what it was hoping to be able to do with, uh, with that capability is lower these apparatuses, in this case um, some high frequency and low frequency antenna, which are connected to this red cable here, which is connected to a big spool down on um, deck two that you might have seen when you're going into the gift shop. It's about two or three kilometers of, of cable there, and so it could drop this down and then be able to maintain its position in the wide open ocean using its bow and stern thrusters to rotate itself and so on and so forth. So you're probably also thinking, well, if it was involved in sound wave research, how could it have used its engines? Because of course that would really interrupt a lot of the, the subtle sound signals that they were sending and receiving. And um, so this ship was originally equipped with three metal sails as well and could maneuver itself up to a knot and a half um, in the right wind conditions, of course, without making any noise at all. So it, it, was, it was built with a lot of this sort of open ocean ruggedness in mind. And we'll go see some of those spots. And Hillinger, of course, has the sails. One was on the bow, and the other two, uh, we'll, we'll go see after we go to the bridge, were up on what is now deck six, which was retrofitted in 2003. So that would have been something to see for sure. Um, right, cables, low frequency, blah, blah, blah. Um, I'd just like to point out a couple of small things here. This is just some of the wonderful detritus left over from the time that's no longer with us. Um, I, just, I just like control panels. It's as simple <laughs> as that. And I just think this is a particularly beautiful one. You don't see things, switches, sort of analog switches like this anymore. Digital boards take over this sort of situation now. Um, and these things aren't really in use right now anymore. So there are some movements. Um, some people who are really interested in getting this and his sister ship back up and running as far as um, these apparatuses are concerned. Um, there's some National Science Foundation grants in the United States that are interested in trying to do that and that might also involve tourism, uh, trying to kind of get the whole tourism and science world moving back together again as many people are doing. So that'll be something to keep in mind um, as things go on in the future. Of course, some of you are familiar with the Kayak Room, which is one of the 13 laboratories we have on the vessel. Um, it is also uh, my favorite room.